Hi, this is Gary Mace back again with the case against episode 29. Today we're going to be looking at uh, the involvement of Vicki and Aaron Hutchinson in the investigation of the murders of Michael Moore, Christopher Byers, Byers, and Stevie Branch on May 5th, 1993. Uh, briefly, uh, Damien Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miskelly Jr., three local teenagers, were convicted uh, of this triple, gruesome triple murder in 1994 and were subsequently released. 2011. Some points to be made about the Hutchinsons that perhaps I don't go in, get into in this chapter, and I'll wrap it up at the end. But I'm going to dive right into it. The Hutchinsons, Vicki and son Aaron, were key to solution of the case. <clears throat> offering tantalizing evidence that resulted in the confession of Jesse Miskelly Jr. and the subsequent arrest of Damien Eccles and Jason Baldwin. Their stories, though, never quite panned out as mother and son both put their imaginations to work on colorful yarns that increasingly posed problems for the prosecution. Tall, red-haired Vicky had a sketchy past, including charges for writing hot checks. In May 1993, the murders occurred on May 5th, 1993. She recently had separated from her husband, having moved on April 11th from the West Memphis neighborhood adjacent to Weaver Elementary to Highland Park. Uh, the neighborhood she moved from was the same neighborhood where the three boys lived. There, the 30-year-old had befriended Jesse Miskelly Jr. Aaron, a sturdily built, dark-haired eight-year-old, was in the same grade as the Dead Boys and in the Cub Scout group run by Michael's father, Todd. Aaron had played regularly with Michael and Christopher. He doesn't seem to have known Stevie that well, but I, I'm certain he knew. He certainly knew Stevie. Aaron's description of their friendship grew over the course of police interviews into an ever-changing narrative in which he became a witness to the killings and ultimately uh, an unwilling participant. But at first he was regarded as truthful in his tales of seeing five men participate in group sex in the woods and cooking a cat near the boys' clubhouse near where the killings occurred. In a report on May 28th, West Memphis Detective Brian Ridge found Aaron's claim to have seen cult activities from the clubhouse to be credible. Ridge, though, was one unable to find any sign of the clubhouse, apparently a tree stand that no longer existed by the time Aaron led officers into the woods. There were some boards about, and that may, that may have constituted the fort, the clubhouse. It's a very common thing that boys do when they get into the woods as they build themselves a little sanctuary, a clubhouse or a fort, and sometimes it's nothing more than just some a few feet of empty space, a small clearing or something that they determine is their uh, base of operation. And that's probably what happened here. Meanwhile, his father, his mother, drinking heavily and consuming a variety of prescribed and illegal drugs, resolved to play detective by getting to know Jesse's friend, Damien. She had heard rumors that Eccles was responsible for the murders. Just a second. She claimed she learned that she, he was involved in a group with a group known as the Dragons, who supposedly worshiped dragons and whose meeting included a ritual in which they sacrificed genitals. 
Victoria Hutchison first heard about the murders while at the Marion Police Department on May 6th as news of the discovery of the body spread. She had taken a lie detector test about a $200 credit overcharge at the truck stop where she worked. She was checking in on the results of the polygraph, which she passed, and she was cleared of potential charges, but was fired nonetheless. She had brought Aaron with her to the station after checking him out of school when she learned the boys were missing. The boys were not known to be dead when the Hutchinsons arrived at Marion Police Department. When Assistant Chief of Police Donald Bray learned Aaron had been friends with Michael and Christopher, he called the West Memphis the Police Department to inform them that Aaron might be a source of information. Then he was told the bodies had been discovered. Just a second, let me do this. I'm getting a little, getting a little, you know, things will be really quiet all day long, and then as soon as I get on here, I'm suddenly getting messages and so forth. But anyway, excuse me, but had something to take care of. Uh, he called when, let me start over again. When Assistant Chief of Police Donald Dr Bray learned D Aaron had been friends with Michael and Christopher, he called the West Memphis Police Department to inform them that Aaron might be a source of information. Then he was told the bodies had been discovered. Bray immediately began questioning Aaron and his mother. Vicki said Christopher and Michael had asked Aaron to come play with them Wednesday right after school, but she had refused permission. Aaron said he had been with his friends several times at Robin Hood Hills and that Michael had gone swimming in the ditch, and the, the ditch is where the bound, beaten up, mutilated bodies of the boys, nude bodies of the boys were found. Aaron's initial account contained none of the over-the-top details that marked later statements. Donald Bray was well acquainted with Jerry Driver and Steve Jones, two juvenile officers who had had extensive dealings with Eccles and his friends. Bray readily concurred with them about possible occult aspects to the killings and with their suspicions about Eccles and Baldwin. Bray was quickly convinced that Aaron could be the source of vital clues, and he went on to pursue information from Aaron long past the point of credibility. I mean, Aaron had stopped being a useful potential witness long before uh, long before the interview stopped. Uh, Aaron's first statement to West Memphis Police on May 10th, uh, mind you, the murders occurred on May 5th, was full of vivid description that had little relation to reality. He said a black man with yellow teeth driving a maroon car had stopped to tell Michael that Michael's mother had sent him to pick up Michael and that Michael rode off with this black man with yellow teeth. Now the Moore backyard literally backed up to the main entrance at Weaver Elementary. Michael would not be accepting a ride home since it was a walk of just a few a few feet, maybe maybe a hundred feet, possibly, maybe a little longer, from uh, the school school entrance to his his own backyard. Uh, no one had no one picked up Michael that day, or, or would have had reason to pick up pick him up. He he walked home that day as usual. On so, Aaron's initial story just had no basis in reality at all, and it has it's a lot of specific. A lot of fairly specific things about the yellow teeth and so forth, but uh, nothing that really bore any credibility. But he had, it was rich, rich in detail. Uh, on May 27th, Aaron told another fantastic tale that just credible enough to excite investigators. A snippet of that inter interview with his childish voice eerily saying, 
Nobody Knows What Happened But Me was played back to Jesse Miskelly on June 3rd, the date of his arrest, one of several effective interrogation techniques used to elicit Miskelly's confession. Aaron said he, Michael, and Chris, Chris had a clubhouse in Robin Hood and that we, quote, sometimes watch these men, they were uh, doing nasty stuff, they, they do what men and women do, unquote, going on to say that the five men gave each other oral sex while the boys watched from a hiding place. He said all but one of the men wore black t-shirts with one wearing a white t-shirt and having long hair. They all carried big knives. He described them smoking rolled up cigarettes that stunk and said they painted their faces black. Quote, there was a skull commander he had on a necklace and there is a snake in its eye, unquote. The necklace was a pendant similar to a pendant or earring that Eccles had lost at the Hutchison home. Aaron had become fascinated by the jewelry after discovering the earring. Hmm. What? Oh, okay. I was thinking this. I was worried about the timeline on this, but Eccles had spent some time at the Hutchison home by May 27th as Vicky was uh, in feigning, feigning an interest in him and uh, had invited him over to meet. The, the, the level of their involvement is open to interpretation and dispute, but there's no dispute that there was some contact between them. Or that Eccles was at the uh, Hutchison home. <coughs> Aaron said the men used a briefcase, a detail that agreed with later stories from Jesse Miskelly Jr. about the cult meetings. Aaron said the men had been mean to a dog, but they caught a cat, cut his head off, and ate it. They ate the whole cat but his head after cooking him. Miss Skelly and others told about killing and eating pets. Aaron thought the boys went to watch the men on Wednesday. They got caught, he said, and then they never told the men, and the men sort of killed them. On June 2nd, shortly before the arrest of his friend Jesse, Aaron elaborated with details about the men, saying they would dance around a fire and say, quote, bad stuff about unquote, about, quote, Jesus and God. I mean, the devil and God. They, that they said they liked the devil and they hate God, unquote. Aaron told Ridge and uh, Mike Allen, another West Memphis officer, they wore all white and they painted themselves black. They all talk in Spanish. Aaron also had a strange story about Miss Skelly. And mind you, this is before the police had talked to Jesse Miss Skelly. Little Jesse said that um, he seen Michael. He seen a police car. He was coming out of the um, and he seen the police car, and like he ran under, back underneath the bridge. He didn't see Chris or Steve. Little Jesse said he seen a uh, um, he seen a cop, cop car coming out from underneath the bridge close to my house. It was close to my, I think they were coming to my house, and they they got lost to where I lived. Now, Aaron Hutchison lived in Highland Trailer Park at that time. Uh, there's an overpass uh, pretty near there that offers uh, access to uh, uh, underneath I-55, that uh, it's not an overpass; it's an under, it's an underpass, as it were, that uh, offers uh, access to a continuation of a kind of service road on the other side of the interstate. Uh, Highland Highland is on one side of the 55, up very close to the 
Marion City Limits. Uh, it's on the east side. East side, Lakeshore Trailer Park was on the west side, and to get from Lakeshore, uh, get from Highland to Lakeshore, without going to a whole lot of trouble, you would go through underneath that overpass underpass whatever it is it's the, the highway goes over and the access road is underneath um, so Brian Ridge asked Aaron you think Stevie and Michael were coming to your house Aaron because I think they all was I told Michael before Ridge where you live so you thought maybe they were going to ride over to your house and little Jesse said he thought he saw them that day is that right Aaron, he did see Michael. Ridge repeated, he did see Michael. Aaron, Michael has brown hair and he had on our Cub Scout t-shirt and his blue pants. Ridge, oh, where did he see him at? He's, he's seen him, you know, that bridge where that train going today? Um, he's seen him underneath that one. That's close to my house. That's actually a different overpass. That would be down, not so close to uh, Aaron's home. Uh, it would be down um, close to the uh, intersection of Missouri Avenue and I-55. Uh, I of course, they don't actually intersect, but there's, there's a complex. Missouri Avenue is one of the main streets in West Memphis. Uh, it's the most direct route up to, to Marion from the uh, West Memphis area. And uh, the trains ran underneath there. So don't pay any attention to what I said earlier about where that overpass was, <laughs> though it is there. Uh, if Miss Kelly actually told Aaron the details about the clothes, that would be highly incriminating, but Aaron's statements had little credibility. As for secondhand statements, hearsay really from Miss Kelly, even less so. In his initial statements, Miss Kelly would say that he had seen a boy on a bicycle near 7th Street, one of the routes between Highland and Robin Hood who hid when he saw a police car. In the seventh, there's a overpass at Seventh Street over uh, the combined uh, I-55, I-40 uh, route through West Memphis where they co-join briefly. Uh, it's quite near the murder site. Apparently, Miss Kelly had told this story about seeing the boy on a bicycle. For, he just told it for some reason. There's not a real clear purpose why he told that story, but he apparently he told some sort of story to Aaron about seeing a boy on a bicycle. Ridge asked Aaron about Miss Kelly's friends, and Aaron mentioned to Bubba, which would be Bubba, Bubba Ashley, and Dennis, which would be Dennis Carter asked about someone named Damien. He said, Bubba's friend, Bubba's friend. I never knew him, but Jesse, Jesse, um, he shown me him and I didn't get real close to him. Ridge asked questions trying to connect possible suspects with men in the woods. But Aaron had never seen any of them elsewhere except once at a flash market convenience store. The man who wore a white tank top was paying for gas for what Aaron describes as a nice car. It was a convertible. Asked if the men had seen the boys in the woods, Aaron replied, uh, I think so because that one man with the white top tank top said, Hi, fellas. It was, he said, wasn't you guys watching us? We got, we got, we got kind of scared. We ran out, right out. He just said, come back. And we didn't say a word because we knew we wasn't supposed to talk to strangers. Ridge 
pushed Aaron to be specific about the, quote, nasty things, unquote, the men did. Aaron explained they would put a penis, quote, in somebody's bottom, unquote. This is from an eight-year-old boy. Uh, after the June 3rd arrest, Aaron gave statements on June 4th, 7th, 8th, and 9th, describing how he rode over to Robin Hood after going home with his mother to Highland on May 5th. Now, he gives statements June 2nd, June 4th, June 7th, June 8th, and June 9th, which means they talked more to Aaron in that week or so than or more often at least, than they talk to anybody else that I'm aware of in the investigation. Uh, Aaron began claiming he witnessed Damien, Jason, and Kel Je Jason and Jesse kill his three friends. The June 4th sta statement to Don Bray had such unlikely details as Michael and Christopher finding guns during the assault. Quote, they said on a count of three, we are going to jump out. And Michael said, one, two, and he jumped out. He pointed the gun at him. He pulled the trigger and nothing came out because it wasn't loaded. Now, that's obviously a purely fantastic tale on the face of it. And this was on June 4th, which, you know, if he's doing this on June 4th, they also talked to him on June 7th, June 8th, June 9th. And, and a number of other times after this. Obviously, this is not a child who's going to come up with a lot of really useful details. He might accidentally give them something. And I can understand why. I can understand why they were talking to him. But so much of it is patently made up, even early on, that you really wonder why they continue to pursue this particular witness so strongly when he had so little to offer that would be useful. Uh, Aaron described Miss Kelly pursuing Stevie. He chased him down, he caught him, and he put his face in the water for about five seconds and pulled it out and he said, I don't want to kill you yet until what my boss says. He went to his boss and he said that you need to kill him because we already killed the other two. Uh, and this boss was apparently Damien. Uh, Miskelly did chase, uh, interestingly enough, did chase down Michael Moore when Michael Moore attempted to escape and dragged him back to the kill scene. So that there's an apparent, apparent element of seeming tr truth there and you wonder where Aaron came up with this unless Miskelly told him but at the same time it's got enough things wrong <laughs> that specifically the pursuit of Stevie instead of, of Michael that it, it already lacks a certain amount of credibility um, Aaron alleged Damien raped Michael, which again, there's the evidence in, in Jess, Jesse Miskello's confession and, and all the other evidence would suggest that Damien did not do that. He did, he's done a lot, he did a lot of horrible things, but he did not do that particular horrible thing. And, and that Michael had died and turned blue after being cut in the neck. And of course, this is ridiculously wrong. Michael was not uh, cut in the neck. He wasn't cut anywhere else, unlike uh, Stevie and uh, Christopher. Uh, none of the boys were cut in the neck <clears throat> in any significant way. He claimed... Chris was also was cut in the neck and, quote, they cut their private parts off, unquote, all the boys. And by that time, the understanding was, based on a media report that appeared in the Commercial Appeal, uh, I think that Saturday after the, the crimes were on a Wednesday, for their Saturday edition, the 
staff there. A guy I actually knew I, was the one who originated the story. I knew I, I worked at the Commercial Appeal. And I knew people there, and he was quite an intrepid reporter in his own way. Uh, James Kingsley overheard this transmission from uh, Arkansas State Police, uh, and uh, based on that transmission, they uh, wrote a story for the Commercial Appeal that used a lot of details from that, including that all the boys have been cut up. Uh, West Memphis Police did not try to correct this story. So whenever Jesse Miskelly Jr. gives these very telling and accurate details about who who was cut and who di and who did the cutting and where they were cut, he had no real source to go on other than his own knowledge of the case. If he was relying simply on rumors he'd heard in the uh, area it would have been all three boys uh, let's presume that's that was what was being said and that would just reinforce the rumors going around that all three boys had been mutilated sexually and in fact only one was, only one was Christopher Byers horrible enough to, to use, even use the term only one because it was a horrible mutilation cruelly per perpetrated by uh, Jason Baldwin, who, despite his seemingly innocent facade, is a monster first class. Aaron claimed Baldwin had walked around the Hutchison home, tapping on the window while carrying, quote, a policeman's gun. Again, something that's totally made up. As far as I, there's no evidence that this happened in, in, in any any narrative that's come up, except this. The parts of the June 4 statement that could be checked out, such as injuries to the boys, bore a little relation to reality. But police continued to set up interviews with the boy. Aaron repeated much of the statement on June 7th, including the descriptions of the boys using guns, and of Damien being the boss. After being asked about contradictory statements concerning the roles of Jason and Jesse, he claimed that Jason asked to be called Jesse. Aaron said on June 8th, Jesse told me that something was going to happen. Something was going to happen to Michael, Chris, and Steve. He, uh, he just said, uh, you go and get your friends and I'll go get my friends. We will go down to Robin Hood and do something. Now, this actually doesn't sound that unlikely that we do know that uh, Baldwin, Miss Kelly, and Eccles had all made a plan to go to West Memphis that afternoon to, as Miss Kelly described it, beat up some boys. Aaron goes on, I seen them Wednesday. I told them to let's go to Robin Hood. And then just asked my mommy if I could go. Steve and Chris came up to my mommy's window and asked if I could go to Robin Hood. They asked if I could go over to his house for two hours and stay. She said no. Then I went there after I got finished doing on my bike. I went the service road, then got the loves and turned. I went to Blue Beacon. The Blue Beacon is a um, was a truck stop, truck wash, located adjacent to Robin Hood Hills where the murders occurred. Uh, I go into this later, but it's possible for Aaron to ride a bicycle from Highland Trailer Park over to this area, but it's not really a bike riding friendly route. You would have to go down the service road, which is not, that stretch of the service road is not particularly heavily trafficked, and then cross the 7th Street Bridge, which is heavily trafficked, trafficked, and then to get down to Blue Beacon would require you getting, uh, yeah, you would have to, you would have to get on the service road and go down that way. 
and there's just not a lot of eight-year-old boys riding their bicycles on the uh, on the service road. Not saying it never happens, or not saying that <clears throat> somebody would have called the police or something, but uh, it would not be something usual, and it, frankly, it would be pretty dangerous for a child, certainly. So Aaron describes going to the Blue Beacon. Then Aaron told Bray he went into the woods where he saw Michael and Chris hiding from them men behind a tree. The five men included Jesse, Jason, and Damien. I didn't know the other two. Aaron said Michael told him that Stevie, who wasn't there, had gone with the fifth man, Miss Skelly. Quote, Steve got away. He got caught back and got killed. Steve seen Jesse and started running. Then he got away and he got away again and got caught. He uh, ran and Jesse, Jesse was chasing him and he hit his face on the pipe, the pipe you walk across. It wasn't bleeding. He just uh, started crying and stuff. It was just a little bruise. Aaron said Michael and Chris jumped out of the trees to help Stevie. Quote, then they got caught and got killed. Uh, the pipe would be the pipe over the 10 mile bayou that would was the access route between the boys neighborhood and these woods uh, it's worth noting that Damien Eccles by his own description in his trial testified yeah there wasn't a lot of he said there was a whole lot that Damien testified to that was untrue but and there's a lot that he says since it's untrue but it, he did say that he walked through this area several times a week uh, as a direct route between where he lived in West Memphis and the trailers of uh, J Jason Baldwin and Dominique here in Lakeshore States it's the only pedestrian route shortcut that really makes a lot of sense and it involves crossing this pipe whether Stevie got away and Jesse chased him down and he bumped his face in the pipe Stevie did have uh, damage to his face uh, that's not what Miss Kelly describes And we can somewhat presume that may, that this is some sort of embellishment from uh, Aaron. Maybe Miss Kelly, possibly, I'm not even suggesting it, it did happen, but maybe Miss Kelly told, told Aaron some of the facts involved in the killings and some of their conversations, because they did spend a lot of time with each other but there's no evidence that Jesse outright confessed to Jace uh, to Aaron except these stories that came about after the uh, after the arrest which makes them everything he says here pretty suspect Aaron said Jesse killed Stevie but then described Stevie running into Damien and being stabbed in the stomach which was not an area where Stevie was actually stabbed. Then, Aaron said, Stevie was cut in the neck. Again, he wasn't cut in the neck. Stevie was stripped and thrown into the water. And they all tur they turned blue and died, all three of them. Uh, later on, he claimed that Jesse raped Stevie. Jesse does not describe in his confessions raping any of the bo uh, any of the boys he does describe Baldwin and Eccles doing this uh, it seems unlikely that even if he did participate in the sexual assaults that he would have readily confessed to such a horrible thing and which is not to say that his own his confession of his other his other involvement in the killings and the attack are not horrible, but 
I guess even child killers have their standards and raping small help with small children may not have been on uh, Miss Skelly's list of things he was willing to do. I, d I don't know. At this point, Aaron's story was some credible or at least possible aspects but wrong on the wounds and other details veered again into sheer fantasy. And, quote, and then they caught me and tied, got tied up in about 40 seconds. I got untied and left and then I didn't remember nothing else about it. Uh, Aaron then said Michael died first with a stab wound to the neck and another wound from Jesse. Michael had no stab wounds to the neck. Aaron said he saw all this from up in a tree. I was trying to climb down, but I fell down and I hit my hit my back. I could hardly walk or get up. I got up and I kicked. I kicked the knife and he, he tied me up and just left me there. They said they might kill me. He said Chris was killed after Stevie after being raped by Damien. The story grew increasingly confused with various claims about who died first, with the story of Michael falling down after trying to get up after being stabbed and then hitting his face on a rock, and wrapping up with the claim that Michael was cut on his private parts, which none of that happened. There's no evidence that any of that happened. The supposed plan for a meetup in the woods to, quote, do something resonated with Miskelly's descriptions of the plan, teen's plans to go into West Memphis that day, but uh, coupled with an incoherent, air-filled fantasy in coming after the arrest of Miss Skelly, Aaron's story only served to frustrate investigators. Vicki originally said Aaron was with her as she ran errands on the afternoon of May 5th. By June 2nd, she was telling a different story to Bray. After initially refusing to let Aaron go over to Michael's house. Quote, she thinks 4 p.m. he rode his bike to his uncle Johnny Deadman's house three streets over. He was supposed to check in with her every two hours. She has not asked Johnny if Aaron was there on that day. She has not asked Aaron either. She doesn't remember if Aaron was back home by 6 p.m. With that lack of detail about that's quotes for the police knows with that lack of detail about her small son's whereabouts it suddenly was possible if unlikely that Aaron had been at Robin Hood Hills on May 5th. Johnny Deadman also figured into Jesse Miskelly's supposed alibi for May 5th with Miskelly and Aaron Hutchinson supposedly both being over at the Deadman house trailer actually at roughly the same time Despite being a potentially important witness, both on the Aaron Hutchison narrative and the Miss Skelly alibi, there is no available police interview with Deadman, though he did show up on the list of potential witnesses for the defense, but he, he did not testify. And I'm not sure he wouldn't have offered any sort of at real alibi to Jesse Miss Skelly uh, since the time that he was, Miss Skelly was supposedly and probably was over at his house, his trailer that afternoon was earlier in the afternoon and offered no kind of alibi for the time of the crimes. Um, in Aaron's June 9th interview with Bray and Gary, Chief Inspector Gary Gitchell in the presence of his mother, Aaron repeated the story about Miss Kelly arranging the meeting. Aaron told them, Quote, Jesse told me that um, something was going to happen to my friends, unquote. He said he was told this on Tuesday with a meetup between the groups set for Wednesday. The story was similar to the previous day's, day's tale with added details such as Jesse was the one who caught him and tied him up again. Aaron, uh, Gitchell pressed Aaron to tell the truth with Aaron claiming that Jesse, quote, abused, unquote, him. It's without a lot of context there to really understand what it, this eight-year-old boy might be talking about. Police interviewed Aaron again on December 31st, 1993 with John Fogelman, 
Donald Bray and James Thompson, who was Vicki Hutchinson's boy, boyfriend, at the East Arkansas Mental Health offices. Taping behind a two-way mirror were Brian Ridge and Gary Gitchell. Vicki Hutchison was elsewhere in the building with Judy Hicks, who was the Hutchison's family therapist. Heron told them that before the killings, Jesse told him that he wanted to meet some of his friends. He said he had seen J Jesse, Damien, and Jason at Robin Hood when he had lived in the neighborhood. He saw them do, quote, what men and women do, unquote. Looking down, avoiding eye contact, Aaron told his story in a quiet, hesitant voice, often difficult to hear. Eventually, he began crying. He said he did not want to talk about his story and had nightmares. Quote, it makes me scared. It is hard not to feel sorry for this poor little kid at this point. Um, I find it all very disturbing that, that they're continuing to press the as uncredible a witness as you could possibly have for details on this. Uh, he's given them nothing useful in all these interviews. And with the exception of the link to Jesse Miskelly Jr., with that one exception, and that you arguably that came more from his mother, uh, he's, he's given them really nothing to go on for the investigation that's going to push it forward. And this is what the fifth or sixth interview that he's had. Pressed for details, Aaron stopped talking and sat picking at his hands and then playing with a watch to keep his hands busy. He admitted his fear of Miss Kelly. They'll kill my mom if I talk. He claimed he had been abused by Miss Kelly. He put his private in my bottom. Aaron said he was afraid he would be taken from his mom because he had been abused by Jesse. Aaron said Miss Kelly wanted him to, quote, do something bad to, unquote, to get into Miss Kelly's club, and Michael and Chris were invited to join. Aaron did not know Stevie would show up. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Aaron again told of riding his bicycle from Highland Park to Robin Hood, traversing the routes of the interstate and service roads. Such a trip, particularly a route of about three miles over the Seventh Street overpass, would be feasible, though not bicycle friendly. He claimed he saw the attack from a hiding place, though Miss Kelly was aware of his presence. I asked him if he wanted, to, if he asked me if I wanted to kill them, and I said no. When the attack was over, he said, "Don't tell anyone, anybody. Don't tell that anybody, or I'll kill your mom." And then Aaron said it was almost dark when he returned home. The next day, Aaron went over to Miss Kelly's house, his trailer actually, and, quote, he only looked at me like I did something bad. His description of Miss Kelly holding down Michael, Damien holding down Stevie, and Jason holding down Chris was in accord with Miss Kelly's confessions generally. Aaron offered a number of contradictory statements about his own role. Aaron said he heard Damien say, we tricked you as the attack started. Aaron claimed there were two others present, a man in a hat with a dragon t-shirt and another male. He could offer a little description beyond that, though he consistently described five attackers. He said the killers carried a duffel bag with equipment for the kill. They used canes in the beatings. Asked in which hand the, the teens held their canes, Aaron told Bray, I get mixed up with right and left. Now, if that's not a poignant comment on all this, I don't know what is. Uh, this is a little eight-year-old boy who literally does not know left from right. Not really. 
and he's being queried about all this, these details on these, this, this, these killings. And there's some of his descriptions sound quite a bit like what actually happened. But how credible are they? It's it's it's, it's it, what is incredible. What is incredible is that they kept talking to the child. Uh, the December 31st first interview was in two parts, both roughly an hour. Aaron benefited from a break, returning in a confident and relaxed mood. Uh, James Thompson was out of the room for the wrap-up session. So Aaron was in there without either his mother or his uh, mother's girlfriend, boyfriend. Um, And he seemed to be more relaxed. I draw whatever conclusions you like from that. I could speculate, but I think it sort of speaks for itself. At times, Aaron seemed strangely lighthearted, smiling as he talked about being abused by Jesse or about his friends being killed in contrast to the earlier session. At one point, he stood up and playfully pulled a knife from his pocket that Thompson had given him. That prompted Aaron describing Jesse having a knife. Aaron played with the knife as the interview progressed, opening and closing the blade. Uh, Donald Bray eventually took the knife from the boy. As the conversation turned toward knives, Aaron identified Damien as having the knife found in the lake behind Baldwin's trailer. Toward the end, Aaron got bored and restless. Quote, I told everything two or three times. Can we leave? Aaron said he was not scared of anyone, quote, unless they're witches. I hate witches and oddly expressed concern about Damien's son, Seth, an infant being a witch. And Seth at that point was, what, three or four months old? Like many others, he said Damien possessed a cat skull. He said they ate the cat after cooking it on a grill top. Then he drew a picture of the cat saying, Help me. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's... <laughs> I have to laugh at that. That's so silly. Uh, <laughs> while Aaron's story on December 31st was less fantastic and more consistent than his earlier fantasies, the small, emotionally fragile boy clearly was not a reliable witness. Bray conducted yet another interview with Aaron at the Marion Police Department on January 3rd, 30th, 1994, prompted by Aaron volunteering details on, quote, some other stuff that happened. Aaron told an implausible story about how Miss Kelly forced him to participate in the castration of Christopher and then drink a glass full of blood. Among unlikely details, he told how a, quote, white guy and a black guy unquote arrived on the scene with the black guy threatening Aaron with a gun and he made me say I hate Jesus and I love the devil Bray pressed for details until the boy lapsed into long silences Aaron did not testify in trial in 2004 which is the last time I've been able to see any public comment from him at all on this he told the Arkansas Times he was no longer sure if he saw the murders or if, shocked by the deaths, he imagined he had seen the murders. At that time, he was convinced that the boys had been killed by Mark Byers, the, step, the adoptive father of Christopher Byers. Uh, just so you're keeping track, that at first they blamed one father and then they blamed the stepfather, another stepfather. And there, the common, the consensus back in, in 2004, heavily pushed by good old Mara Leverett, was that Mark Byers was the one responsible for the killings. She doesn't come right out and, she doesn't come right out and accuse him, but she does everything possible to point to him uh, in her book, Devil's Knot, and then the story she was writing for the Arkansas Times at the time. 
In the same story, Aaron said his statements had been complete fabrications. He said the police, and that I believe, he said the police tricked him into saying things that were not true. I didn't see a whole lot of trickery going on, but the statements clearly did contain elements of truth. He did know the dead boys, for example. As with the, his mother, who eventually claimed her Eccles stories were wildly exaggerated, a blanket disclaimer raised questions that likely will never be answered. His mother did testify in the Miss Kelly trial, though not the Eccles Baldwin trial, giving a fairly straightforward description of how Eccles with Miss Kelly took her to a witches meeting. She testified she and Eccles left, but Miss Kelly stayed. Jurors did not hear salacious details about incipient orgies and other bizarre goings on. And with that, I'm going to wrap this up for the day. That sums up Aaron Hutchinson's involvement in the case. Uh, and his mother has a, a more pro problematic role. It's worth noting and reiterating that neither one of these witnesses offered anything like real inf information that was really vital to the investigation with one key all-important exception and that is the Jesse Miskelly connection to Damien Eccles. Jesse Miskelly was not on the police radar prior to these interviews with the Hutchinsons. Police had talked to quite a few acquaintances of Miskelly in the trail parks. Um, pri prior to the arrest, they were interested in not just Damien Eccles and Jason Baldwin. They were trying to get some information from what they perceived as a likely source of of um, where the killers had actually come from. And uh, the Eccles had set himself up as the prime suspect really early on. You know rapidly changing alibis, uh, failing a polygraph, and some very, very troubling answers to uh, the initial initial uh, in interrogation, you know, where he famously said that, you know, the killer w would be made happy by the killings of these three boys, etc. So police pegged him very, and, and, and the uh, sightings by the Hollingworth, Hollingsworth family. That, th those, those elements made Eccles of the prime suspect very early in the case, within days of the killings. And it had nothing to do with black t-shirts, his haircut, or the fact that he liked the recordings of Metallica. Uh, Aaron, as you can see, talked to police a lot, as I say, more than any other potential witness in the case, yet nothing he said made him a suitable uh, witness at trial. And while we can question how he got right the things he did get right and there were some things he did get right I mean where did he get that information did Miss Kelly tell him things I don't know uh, were his mo was his mother feeding him information she says no but I'm not sure how credible that is consider nothing she, else she does is that credible and by her own admission she was a liar uh, she testified 
we'll get into this in the, my next episode on this podcast. She testified at the Miscelli trial, but she did not testify at the Baldwin Eccles trial, and she offered very little in terms of evidence of Miscelli's involvement in the crime in her testimony in the, uh, uh, the Miscelli trial. What she did, what she did offer, for what it's worth, is a connection of Miskelly and Eccles in the occult uh, with this trip to the supposed Espot or Esbot, as it's more correctly known. And they already had the confessions of Miskelly that he was involved in in the occult. We have Eccles' read, ready acknowledgement. I mean, it's almost bragging about it, that he was involved in the occult. So while, <coughs> while Vicki Hutchison offered <coughs> excuse me, I'm about to go, but uh, while Vicki Hutchison did offer a rather sensational focus for the news that day in the courtroom with her fairly wild story about traveling to this this uh, backwoods orgy she offered really nothing much that was really going to help the prosecution except the except the questionable value of the publicity that would have come from her appearance and uh, My next episode, I will get into the very questionable activities, statements of Victoria Hutchison. I, I don't intend to, as, as always, I don't intend to take so long between episodes. Uh, a little bit of coughing today. I have a very, for some reason, I have a very sensitive throat. If I talk for a long time, I start coughing. And I thought the problem had cleared up for a while, and it seems it's come back. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, to treat that more aggressively. And um, improve the speed with which I go through this book. Where, uh, Blood on Black. I've got another bo whole other book to go. I've been doing this for a little bit over a year now. 29 episodes. I've got a whole other book to go through. Where the Monsters Go. And some odds and ends I, that I would certainly fill out several episodes. Then I would be basically through with the coverage of the case. The, the books are fairly complete. As complete as they could be, they're they're both two the two volume set. There's two large books uh, covered every aspect of the case that I felt warranted that kind, warranted any kind of coverage, including some side treks into you know L. G. Hollingsworth and and most most of the Hutchison saga could really I could boil this down into you know very short statement that they that they offered that Aaron and Vicki offered uh, statements to police but offered nothing that police found that particularly useful I would hope I word it better I write better than I talk hopefully which is why I'm a print guy and I'm not really a podcast guy uh, I don't know if I wrap this up that I will pursue uh, podcasting with anything else. I'm not sure I'm that good at it, for one thing. Uh, and it, I don't get the same kind of uh, satisfaction that I get from writing. It's, uh, it's, this, is, this podcast, to me, is more of a duty and, to a certain extent, a privilege. Uh, 
but it's not something that I really, really wanted to do. I don't enjoy listening to myself talk. No, you might not know it from all the talking I'm doing now as I ramble on when I said I was about to drop out. But, uh, you know, it's I, I don't, at times I'm more articulate than others, but sometimes I, I'm a little frustrated that I'm searching for the right word. And I, I, you know, it creates all this, well, it creates all this, hmm, I just had a good example. That was a perfect example of what it creates. I'm always searching for the right word. Yeah. Anyway, probably too much, too much rambling here at the end, but I hope you got something out uh, on the front end and understanding that Aaron Hutchison seemed like a really good potential witness but he just, it just never panned out. And that at some point, somebody should have called a halt to the interviews with the boy. I can't really fault Fogelman, the, the December 31st interview, I really can't fault Fogelman uh, and the others that were involved in that particular interview. Um, they videotaped it. They set it up. They had a parent. They had a parental surrogate stand, you know, sitting in on it. James Thompson for the at least the first part of the session, and uh, I could see that them making one last try to maybe get something useful out of Aaron. It's hard to see what use, what was useful. that came out in those interviews in early June, and there were a number of them. And frankly, Victoria Hutchison should have done a better job of protecting her son, but she apparently wasn't too good at that. I mean, she she's in trouble. She's written hot, she'd been in trouble before for writing hot checks. She takes, she's, going to a police department. She doesn't know what the result of the polygraph is going to be. And she brings her eight-year-old boy that she, that she could have left, whom she could have left in school. She brings him to the police station with her to hear the results of a polygraph. Very, very questionable behavior and not, and not, not good, not good mothering, not good parental skills. Uh, very troubled woman, as I think she even admits at that time, she was very troubled. She went on after after her involvement in the case had, had ebbed and she was just simply Victoria Hutchison, who's living in Crittenden County or wherever. She had continuing problems of one sort or another. A lot of them involving uh, drugs or alcohol. Um, and then she <clears throat> had the opportunity to set, finally set things straight uh, in 2004. And she's willing to talk to the press, the friendly Arkansas Times press, but she's not willing to go into the court and actually try to set the record straight. So. To say she's not a very impressive person as far as moral character is concerned would be an understatement. But there are a lot of the people like that in this this case. Anyway, thank you for listening. This is Gary Meese. This is the Case Against Podcast. I'm signing out, finally.